Welcome to Perifractic's Retro Recipes. I recently discovered the incredible work of Richard Parry, and it was clear that, like us, he also loves retro recipes. So relax and enjoy these incredible cross-sections as we step back in time, step inside these beautiful devices, and bring the photography to life with some assembly required. And our first device is the Game Boy, an 8-bit handheld game console developed and manufactured by a small company called Nintendo. Combining aspects of the NES with its earlier handheld Game & Watch devices, the Game Boy was the brainchild of longtime Nintendo employee and Metroid creator Gunpai Yokoi. Inside the Game Boy is a custom 8-bit Sharp LR35902 running at 4.19 MHz, and its CPU is actually a hybrid between the Intel 8080 and the Zilog Z80. And it was followed up, albeit 8 years later, by the Game Boy Color. Its Zilog Z80 processor has a few extra bit manipulation instructions and a clock speed of around 8 MHz, twice as fast as the original, not to mention three times the RAM. And although the screen resolution is the same as the original Game Boy, at a whopping 160 by 144 pixels, it's the addition of 16 colors that really set it apart, even if they did misspell color. <clears throat> and at 120 million units, they were the best selling consoles ever for the time. Well, for a video about retro photographs, you can't get more retro or iconic than the Polaroid 1000. The camera includes a one element 103mm f14.6 plastic lens, fixed focus, and even an exposure compensation dial knob. And for the Polaroid Corporation, it became the best selling camera of the 1977 holiday season. I know I loved mine. And speaking of photos, you were probably wondering how these photos were made. And that's really what they are. Photos of each component meticulously stitched together. Dubbed the most wildly ambitious consumer electronics device of its era, I think we can agree that it realized co-founder Edwin Land's dream. Absolute one-step photography. The Nintendo 64, technically named after its CPU's 64-bit accumulator, though not really comparable to today's 64-bit processors. It was released in June 1996 and was the last major home console to use the cartridge as its primary storage format, until the Switch. During the system's first three days on the market, retailers sold almost all of the available units and was in such demand that even celebrities, including Chandler Bing, I mean Matthew Perry, allegedly tried contacting Nintendo directly to get one. The N64 could display resolutions of up to a forceful 640 by 480 pixels and 16 million colors. Having sold 33 million units, it was retired in 2002 following the launch of the GameCube. And we'll come to that soon. 1994's Sony PlayStation was the first entertainment system to sell over 100 million units, although that took it nine years. Inside the PS is a 32-bit MIPS R3051 running at 33.9 MHz, 16-bit sound, 2 MB of RAM, and up to a 640 by 480 resolution and 16 million colors. It's also one of the few devices to have been re-released twice with the year 2000 redesigned PS1, and it even had a baby with 2018's miniaturized PlayStation Classic. The literally game-changing Wii was released in November 2006 and forever revolutionized the world of gaming with its Wiimote, Nunchuck, and Wi-Fi for web surfing, multiplayer games, and even downloads of then-retro games. The Wii competed indirectly with Microsoft's Xbox 360 and the PS3, with Nintendo stating that its console targets a broader demographic, and that demographic agreed even without HD graphics. 
As of 2016, the Wii led the market with more than 101 million units sold. And although Nintendo closed the Wii Shop channel back in January 2019, the console lives on in us. Or should I say, in Wii. The equally millennial Sony PlayStation 2 was so popular that a man named Dan Holmes even changed his name to Mr. PlayStation 2. Ridiculous idea, changing your name for retro computing. <clears throat> Inside the machine is the Emotion Engine CPU, a custom designed processor based on the MIPS architecture with a floating point speed of 6.2 gigaflops and a custom GPU capable of rendering up to 75 million polygons per second. Unlike Nintendo, the software is delivered on CD-ROMs, giving the benefit of being able to play music CDs and DVD movies, as well as being backward compatible with the original PlayStation that we saw earlier. By 2013, it had sold 155 million units, beating the Game Boy at its own game. We all know and love the Commodore 64, but what about the Brick 4 This is my LEGO implementation of Commodore's record-breaking machine, which at over 18 million units is still the best-selling home computer of all time. The life-sized Brick 4 features a sprung mechanical LEGO keyboard and is made of 2,192 bricks, weighing in at 2.2 kilograms or nearly five pounds. And you can even put a real keyboard and PCB inside this, making it the only replacement C64 case option available. And speaking of beautiful PCBs, if you're thinking of creating your own, I recommend PCB Way. And as we all know, PCB stands for Parry's Computer Bits, doesn't it? Either way, if you'd like to see LEGO release the Brick 4 you can vote for it now at LEGO Ideas. And last, but probably not least, the Nintendo GameCube. The console was praised for its controller, software library, and high quality games, but not so much for its design and lack of features. I don't know though, I kind of like it, especially in this teardown form. Partnering with Nintendo in 1998, ArtX began the complete design of the system logic and of the graphics processor, codenamed Flipper. And with an earlier internal codename of N2000, this could have been the Nintendo 2000, if it hadn't been released in 2001. Still, Nintendo sold 22 million units before the console was discontinued in 2007. That's more than the Commodore 64, so not to be sniffed at. Did you know they even considered including 3D support, though that work was shelved and later showed up in the 3D version of the Nintendo DS. Which brings us back to the start. Everything old is new again, after all. Well, that's all for this recipe. but if you enjoyed this little stroll down nostalgia lane, don't forget to subscribe and check out Richard Parry's Prince Shop below. Join me again next time for more retro goodness. And until then, comment below. And cheerio!